Thanks so much to the symposium organizers for making this virtual session happen. I'm Jen Rogers, current director of the Sevilla LTR site in New Mexico, and I'm honored to represent a large group of researchers who have been leveraging the power of LTR experiments to understand evolutionary processes in the wild. To detect evolutionary change and response to changes in the environment requires considering the four processes that influence evolution. This framework is intended to inspire researchers at other sites to begin thinking about when and where evolutionary responses may be most important to predicting long-term ecological change. First, recombination and mutation influence allele frequencies. Environmental changes can affect processes that influence recombination, such as assorted of mating, phenology, and population size. For example, warming temperatures may cause only some plant genotypes to flower earlier than others, increasing assortative mating and reducing recombination across the whole population. Environmental changes that dramatically reduce or increase population size could affect the absolute number of new mutations which will be greater in larger populations than smaller ones. Second, environmental changes that influence species distributions by affecting dispersal or migration could alter allele frequencies by influencing patterns of gene flow. This could be important, for example, in cases where species are shifting their elevational or latitudinal ranges under climate warming. Third, changes that reduce population size will increase the likelihood of a non-adaptive evolutionary change through increased genetic drift and reduced genetic diversity. And lastly, the majority of existing studies, really the bulk of the published literature, addresses how environmental change alters the process of natural selection. Environmental change can influence which traits are under the strongest selection, can magnify or reduce fitness differences among genotypes, and alter the strength of selection gradients on species traits. Additionally, natural selection could alter genetic covariances among traits when multiple traits are involved in responding to change. Theory predicts that the community context will alter how species evolve in response to environmental change. This is why long-term field experiments are so essential to advancing understanding. In diverse ecological communities, interactions among agents of selection may constrain or accelerate selection and the adaptive responses to new environmental challenges. For example, if we picked out just one species in this network of species interactions, we'd have to consider not only its direct response to an environmental change, but also shifts in natural selection caused indirectly through changes in the interactions that that species is involved in. Therefore, to make accurate predictions on evolutionary change for our ecological future, we need studies that capture the complex evolutionary responses to environmental change in realistic field settings. Enter the LTR network. There are several reasons why the LTR network is nicely positioned to tackle transformative research in evolution. First, long-term funding supports the experimental platforms required to track evolutionary change. Replication occurs at the large spatial scales that are needed to detect change in allele frequencies, which happen at the scale of populations. And rich natural history gleaned from long-term observations speeds the process of honing in on the species likely to be the most responsive or sensitive. Today, I will walk you through three case studies that illustrate the power of the LTR network for understanding evolution. Each example has a unique punchline that helps to highlight the diversity of approaches and species represented across LTR sites. The first case study comes from our work at the Sevilla LTR site in New Mexico. The foundation plant species, black grama grass, dominates grasslands of southwestern North America. Black grama is certainly not the first plant species you'd choose to study evolution. 
It's a perennial with mostly clonal reproduction as stolons, and it's assumed to have low standing genetic diversity because of this life history. However, clonal populations may be highly sensitive to environmental disruptions if low standing genetic diversity provides little buffer against change. We imposed three years of experimental drought involving 66% less rain during the growing season and drought reduced black grandma biomass more than 90% relative to control plots. You can see that from this picture here, we're in the foreground here looking at a plot that has been under a drought shelter. From each replicated plot, we collected cohorts of live plants and in drought plots where plants had died, we also collected an equivalent number of dead plants. We then sequenced the DNA from those cohorts to identify SNPs. The populations that survived the drought had significantly reduced allelic richness relative to populations in control plots, suggesting a selection bottleneck caused by the drought. Furthermore, individual plants that died under drought genetically differed from those that survived, as you can see in this NMDS plot. This plot uses data on unique SNPs to look for genetic differentiation among co cohorts. Each point is a replicate cohort of individuals from a unique plot in the field experiment. We expect that these individuals and died, that died, shown in black here, under drought, had distinctive traits and alleles that made them less resistant to drought. In the next story, I'm gonna take you across the country to Harvard Forest LTR, where long-term experiments include a simulated nitrogen deposition treatment that has been running since 1988. This experiment includes 50 or 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, applied as monthly additions of aqueous ammonium nitrate. Ecological responses to this environmental change included strong changes in microbial extra, extracellular enzyme activity, as well as shifts in the soil fungal community composition. And then at the ecosystem scale, these community changes suppress the rate of decomposition and increase the carbon pool in soils, as you can see in this graph of soil carbon stocks, which were significantly greater under nitrogen additions. To test for an evolutionary response they, that may underlie these ecological changes, Harvard forest researchers set up a common garden experiment to decouple fungal genotypes from the environment that they occur in. They isolated fungi from the field plots and then grew them in the lab on litter collected from the field. In the lab, they crossed the origin of the fungi with applications of the same levels of nitrogen in the growth medium as were applied in the field. This common garden approach is an effective way to understand evolutionary change because it decouples the phenotype from the environment that it experienced in the field. The fungal isolates from control plots, which are shown here as white bars, decompose litter faster than the isolates from nitrogen addition plots, shown in gray or black, regardless of the nitrogen level in the environment of the petri dish. This occurred across two fungal phyla, shown here in white for basidiomycota, or blue for ascomycota. So populations of fungi from nitrogen-enriched plots were less able to decompose plant litter than populations of the same species growing in control plots. This effect of the origin of the isolates outweighed the influence of the short-term nitrogen treatment in the lab and did not interact with the level of nitrogen during lab incubation. Together, these results indicate that over the 30 years of nitrogen additions, there was selection for slow to decompose fungal genotypes in the nitrogen addition plots. For our final example, I take you to Kellogg Biological Station in Northern Michigan. Here, researchers have been fertilizing old fields for more than three decades. In this case study, the focal species were clovers and their beneficial rhizobia bacteria. This mutualism is one of the most important mutualisms in terrestrial ecosystems. Rhizobia fix atmospheric nitrogen into a form that plants can use, then trade that nitrogen for carbon from the plant. The fertilizer additions in this experiment 
were comparable to the high end of additions at Harvard Forest with 123 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year added as granular, granular ammonium nitrate. The long-term nature of this experiment is perhaps best illustrated by these photos showing the lead investigators who were in elementary school when this experiment began. Soils from fertilized plots were taken to the common environment of the greenhouse and grown with three species of clovers, which are shown along the x-axis here. Soils originated from, originating from fertilized plots reduced the number of rhizobia nodules on clover roots, which you can see here in the red bars. Soils from fertilized plots also reduced clover biomass, indicating that nitrogen addition in the field promoted soil microbial communities that were less beneficial to legumes. Thus, across all three clover species, fertilized soils resulted in fewer nodules and less plant biomass. So reduced cooperation in this legume rhizobium mutualism. A second experiment isolated single rhizobia strains from field soils and inoculated those individually onto the clovers. On average, across all the strains tested, those originating from fertilized plots were less beneficial than strains originating from control plots. This experiment pinned causality on the rhizobia populations in the soil rather than on other members of the soil microbiome. The KBS team also investigated genomic mechanisms underlying these results. Lateral gene transfer of nitrogen fixation ability was rampant and could explain some, but not all, of the evolutionary loss of cooperation. This plot shows you FSTs across the rhizobia genome with genome position along the x-axis. FST analyses revealed significant genetic differentiation between the rhizobia populations that have, had evolved in the nitrogen addition treatments and those that had evolved in the control plots. The genetic differences were greatest for six genes on the PSYM plasmid, which can be laterally transferred among bacteria and also carries a number of nitrogen fixation genes. Thus, rhizobia strains from plots with a long history of fertilization had lost some capacity to fix atmospheric nitrogen, explaining the reduction in their benefits to plants. We hope these case studies have illustrated how the LTR network has pioneered new research directions in evolutionary biology. And perhaps the most important take home message from this talk is that these LTR examples demonstrate that evolution happens fast, fast enough to impact current ecological interactions, creating the potential for eco-evolutionary feedbacks. So where to go from here? Well, we came up with the following suggestions. First, build cross-site integration of LTR research in evolutionary biology. This talk is the first time that case studies from these different LTR sites have been compared side by side. So there are clearly opportunities for cross-site synthesis just waiting to happen. For example, several sites maintain long-term fertilization experiments, like those at Harvard Forest and KBS, perhaps opening a possibility to compare microbial evolutionary change across the diversity of ecosystems. Second, in current long-term experiments, with just a single year of data collection, we can use classic quantitative genetics to measure natural selection. Phenotypic selection analysis simply requires measuring species traits and relating those traits to fitness, and the strength of selection gradients can then be compared among long-term treatments and controls. Third, many LTR sites archive historical samples, seeds or soils that could facilitate resurrection experiments to compare historical and contemporary populations at different stages of the evolutionary process. Such resurrection experiments may be particularly informative when samples are saved from imposed experimental treatments, then compared in a common garden design. Lastly, we suggest that more sites begin evolutionary monitoring, archiving both DNA and museum specimens for key species on a regular basis, as we are now doing at the Sevieta LTR. Similar archival methods for populations and long-term experiments 
would provide the raw material for experimental evolution studies that track change in allele frequencies over long time periods in response to perturbations. Thanks to everyone who's taken the time to listen to this talk. I'm looking forward to our live question and answer session this week. <laughs>